بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما Respects and listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and blessed us in many ways. Life itself is a blessing. And for everything that Allah has given us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects shukr, gratitude and belief. And not ingratitude and disbelief. And the two are connected. In the Quran, Allah often contrasts shukr with kufr. So gratitude is contrasted with ingratitude, meaning disbelief. So on the one hand you have belief and gratitude, and on the other hand you have ingratitude and disbelief. For instance, even to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say to them, say to the Quraysh, قُلْ أَفَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَأْمُرُونِّي أَعْبُدُ أَيُّهَا الْجَاهِلُونَ قُلْ أَفَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَأْمُرُونِّي أَعْبُدُ أَيُّهَا الْجَاهِلُونَ وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ بَلِ اللَّهَ فَاعْبُدْ وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِ so addressing the Prophet wasallam, Allah said to him, Say to the unbelievers that of Mecca, the Quraysh, that what? Is it someone or something other than Allah that you are commanding me to worship? Ayyuhal jahilun, O ignorant ones. When? Indeed, it has been revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and even to those who came before you, that la'in ashrakta, that if you commit shirk, if you ascribe partners unto Allah, layahbatanna amaluk, your deeds will perish, and you will surely become of the losers. So here in this whole verse, in fact in these two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in your dialogue with the unbelievers of the Quraysh who opposed you, say to them that is it something or someone other than Allah that you are commanding me and instructing me to serve and to worship? When the consistent message throughout history to all of the prophets and their nations, and to me too, has been that if you ascribe partners unto Allah, your deeds will perish. So here Allah speaks about shirk and associating partners with Allah turning to and serving something or someone other than Allah, which is all about disbelief, disbelief in Allah. And then Allah contrasts this in the next verse with the words, i.e. don't do any of this, rather, بَلِلَّهَ fa'bud, Rather, let it be Allah that you worship, 
وَكُمْ الشَّاكِرِينَ and be of the grateful ones. So, in fact, even to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, وَقَالَ يَا مُوسَىٰ إِنِّي اسْتَفَيْتُكَ عَلَى النَّاسِ بِرِسَالَاتِي وَبِكَلَامِي فَخُذْ مَا آتَيْتُكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ That Allah said to Musa alayhi salam, O Musa, indeed, I have selected you and chosen you over the people with my messages and with my speech. So seize and hold on to take what I have given you. وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ And be of the grateful ones. So that to the Prophets of Allah, alayhim salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this clear instruction, be of the grateful ones. But going back to what I was saying, the most important thing is that Allah contrasts shirk with shukr. Specifically to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says to him, if you were to commit, and it was revealed to you and to those who came before you, that if you associate partners with Allah, then your deeds will surely perish. Nay, rather, let it be Allah that you worship. وَكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ And be of the grateful ones. So shukr has been contrasted with kufr. Because ultimately that's the meaning of kufr. Kufr means to conceal and therefore deny the favours and the blessings of Allah. It's all about ingratitude. When a person receives a favour from another, and then they do not repay that kindness with kindness, they do not return that favour, they do not reciprocate, in any good way. Rather, they ignore the other person. They ignore the favour done unto them. Or they may actively turn away and be grateful and be good with others rather than the benefactor. That kind of behaviour in human interaction is despicable. So you've got one person. He does good to another. The recipient of that favour and of that kindness is ungrateful to this benefactor. Ignores him. Overlooks him is not grateful in any way, and to add insult to injury, the person then goes and shows kindness and goodness to others. Now, in human interaction, this is considered very lowly and despicable. And this is what happens with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person receives all these blessings from Allah. And a person is then ungrateful to Allah. Rather than being grateful to Allah for all that they have received, beginning with the gift of life. Beginning with the gift of life. A person is ungrateful to Allah. And not only ungrateful to Allah, but ignores Allah and devotes their attention and their devotion and their worship and their love and their loyalty to others. If I can quickly give an example, it often happens. Parents make great sacrifices for their children. They really do. Now imagine the parents, 
They've gone through great sacrifice in bringing up their children, in protecting them, in providing for them, in nurturing them, in looking after them, in giving them a good, a good upbringing. And when the parents become old and frail and weak, and they are now in need of their children's love, devotion and attention, Throughout their lives, the children haven't paid, haven't shown any real gratitude. It's remarkable. Children often take it for granted that this is what parents do and this is what they have to do. This sense of entitlement. And then, after having shown no gratitude, When the parents most need them, the children actually go and be kind to and help and serve others. Imagine the pain that these parents must go through and must feel. That this is our child. He or she should be serving us, helping us, looking after us just as we helped them and looked after them in need, and rather than repaying us our kind favour rendered unto them, they actually go and show kindness to others who are undeserving. So, and this happens a lot. In essence, this is what a person does with Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showered his favours upon an individual and then that person turns away from Allah, fails to show gratitude to Allah and in fact goes a step further and to add insult to injury, serves someone else, shows loyalty to someone else, shows devotion to someone else or something else. The love that should have been reserved for Allah, the loyalty and devotion that should have been reserved for Allah, the service that should have been made exclusive for Allah, that service, that love, that devotion is shown and given elsewhere. That is the highest form of ingratitude. And this is why Ingratitude is associated with disbelief in the Qur'an, repeatedly. And it's contrasted, shukr is contrasted with shirk, associating partners with Allah. Because that's what a person does. Rather than be grateful to Allah, the person is showing gratitude to something or someone else. And that's the highest form of ingratitude. And this is why shukr is contrasted with kufr and shukr is contrasted with shirk. Shukr meaning gratitude. Because the word kufr from which this is the root word kufr meaning disbelief, unbelief from which the word kafir is derived. The root letters of this word, kufr, refer to concealment because that's what a person does. So allow me to explain this. Kufr, the word kafir, in the Quran and in the hadith, in its original meaning, should not be taken to mean something insulting like a heathen or a heretic. I'm talking about the original meaning. The word kafir comes from kufr in contrast to shukr. So shukr is to be grateful, kufr is to be ungrateful. Because when a person refuses to show gratitude for a favour, it's almost as though they are 
denying it, that I don't owe you anything, I don't owe you any gratitude, you haven't done me any favours that I owe you a favour. That's in human interaction. So when a person refuses to be grateful to Allah, refuses to show gratitude to Allah, loyalty and devotion to Allah, sincerity to Allah, it's almost as though that person is saying, I don't owe you anything. I don't owe God. I don't owe Allah anything. And it's as though the person is concealing, denying, i.e. concealing and hiding the blessings and the favours showered upon them by Allah. So the word kufr means to cover. The root letters, gaf, fa, ra. There are no vowels written in Arabic per se. You have the root letters. And the root letters here are, the consonants are, gaf, fa, and ra. In English, ker, The root letters are actually the same. So if you remove the vowels from the word cover, remove the O and remove the E, you're left with C, V, R, that's gafara, that's kufr. And that's what kufr in Arabic originally means. I'm not, uh, this isn't, uh, I'm not playing verbal gymnastics. These are, this is the original meaning of kufr. This is why in Arabic, a cloud is also called a kafir. Because a, 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 a rain-laden cloud, or a cloud, a dense cloud, is called a kafir, because it covers. The night is called a kafir, because it covers. The ocean, one of the names for the ocean, it's called bahr, but another name for the ocean is kafir. The sea is called kafir. Why? Because the water, the, th the layer of water, hides and conceals so much in its depths. So the ocean is called kafir because it hides, it covers. A dense cloud is called kafir because it covers. The night is called kafir because it covers. Another related word is gawr. So instead of gafara, gaf, and then wow, gawara. Gawr means to fold. So when you fold something, they're both connected. What happens when you fold something? If there's something here and you fold it, by folding it, you hide and cover the thing in between. This is why uh, in Surah Al-Taqweer, what does Allah say? إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ when the sun shall be folded. Kuwirat. So these words are related. Gawara, gafara. They mean to they all mean to cover. A farmer is called a gafir. A farmer is called a gafir. Because why is a farmer called a gafir? Because a farmer takes the seeds and covers them with the soil. And in a verse of Surah Al-Hadid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speaking about the reality of worldly life, Allah gives the parable and the example, the similitude of rain. Allah describes and compares the worldly life and its beauty and its glitter and its ornamentation and its attraction and adornment. Allah compares all of this to rain, which does what? Allah says, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Know that indeed the worldly life is nothing but play and frivolity and an adornment and mutual boasting amongst yourselves and one-upmanship. In children and in riches. So Allah says, this is the reality of the worldly life. And this is just like, Allah then goes on to give an example, a parable. Like rain. Who 
whose vegetation and whose produce pleases the farmers. So here the word kuffar, plural of kafir, means the farmers, the zurrar. So when rain falls, what happens? All of a sudden, seeds sprout, vegetation, the plants, the crops grow, and they, the land blooms and blossoms. And this pleases the farmers. But then, but then this lush, green, upright vegetation, which sprung up so beautifully, withers, pales, becomes yellow, dies, and becomes stubble, dry stubble. So as quickly as it rises and flourishes and blooms and blossoms and looks so colourful, just as rapidly and soon enough, it wanes, withers, pales, drops, droops, collapses, and disappears. That's the reality of worldly life. So in that verse, Allah mentions the word kuffar. But the word kuffar here is a reference to the farmers. Not unbelievers per se, but farmers. So... As you can see, the word kafir comes from the root word kufr, which means to cover, to conceal. Kufr means to cover. So a kafir is someone who covers, someone who covers the blessings of Allah. And this is why throughout the Qur'an, Allah contrasts kufr with shukr. Shukr, uh, gratitude with disbelief, because Disbelief is the highest form of ingratitude, almost as though the person is concealing and hiding and covering the blessings and the gifts of Allah so that they don't have to show any gratitude for them. That you haven't done anything for me, given me anything, that I owe you anything. But the reality is, for those who believe in Allah, Allah has commanded them. To be grateful for everything, for the gift of life. If we can just begin with this, for the gift of life. Things may not be good for us. We may have our problems and our suffering and our anxieties. But subhanAllah, the greatest gift is that we are alive. That in itself is a blessing. To be alive. Gratitude is about positivity. Looking at the positive things, looking at the good things, looking at what we have and focusing on that rather than focusing on the negative of what we don't have. No one person can have everything. They really can't. A person cannot have the opposites. And one person can't have everything. So when a person focuses on what they do have, life, the gift of life, the blessing of life, the blessing of health. In fact, in a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, on the day of reckoning, one of the first things that will be said to the servant of Allah is, أَلَمْ نُصِحَّ لَكَ جِسْمَكَ وَنُرْوِيكَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ الْبَارِدِ that did we not give health to your body and did we not give you cold water to drink? Air and water are blessings of Allah. And we should never forget that. In Surah Al-Takathur, and they are connected. 
At the beginning of Surah Al-Takathur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about one-upmanship, rivalry. Alhaakum al-Takathur, hatta zurtum al maqabir Rivalry, one-upmanship, worldly competition, vying with each other. This has distracted you. Until you visit the graves, it seems like this will remain your state throughout your lives until you visit your grave. That all you are concerned about is competing with others, vying with others, rivaling others in the dunya, keeping, keeping up with the Joneses next door, keeping up with the neighbours, one-upmanship. Always trying to beat someone else in the world, in the worldly life. And it seems as though this has distracted you. Well, it not seems, this has distracted you. And will remain so until you visit the graves. So at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about worldly distraction, rivalry, com unhealthy com worldly competition, one-upmanship, etc. And then later in the same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the day of reckoning and then says, then surely on that day you will be questioned about the blessing. I.e. all blessings and every blessing. We will be questioned about blessings. So when this verse was revealed, it's mentioned, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in his Musnad, he narrates a few hadith from different about different Sahaba radiallahu anhum who actually said, when this verse was revealed, Surely, then, surely, on that day, you will be questioned about the blessings. Some of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عَنْ أَيَّ نَعِيمٍ نُسْأَلْ عَنْ أَيَّ نَعِيمٍ نُسْأَلْ Which blessings will we be questioned about? What blessings will we be questioned about? All we have are the two things, dates and water, because often, indeed, the Arabs didn't have much except dates and water. So the Sahaba عنه, said to the Prophet وسلم, Ya Rasulullah, what will we be questioned about? In one narration, all we have is dates and water. And in another narration, Ya Rasulullah, what will we be questioned about? What blessings will we be questioned about? All we have are dates and water, and right now we live in a state of fear, of invasion in the city of Medina. So we live in a state of fear. There's no security. And for food and drink, we have dates and water. So which blessings will we be interrogated about? So the Prophet ﷺ's reply was, it will happen. You will be questioned. You will be questioned. Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi relates that the one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out of his noble uh, came out of his house and he came across Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum. They were together. And it wasn't the normal hour for them to come out. So he said to both of them, what brings you out together at this time? So Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum said, Ya Rasulullah, hunger. Hunger has driven us out at this time. Both of them together. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, by Allah, that which has driven you out has brought me out too. Meaning I am hungry too. Come Let's go and visit such and such a person. So the three of them, the Prophet وسلم, and his two fathers-in-law and the Shaykhain, Abu Bakr and Umar عنهما, they went together to visit this Ansari companion. So when they arrived, he wasn't at home, but his family invited the Prophet وسلم, and his two companions in. And he said, where is Fulan, i.e. the father of the household? 
So the family said, he's gone out to fetch water for us. So when he returned and he realized that I have the Prophet وسلم, along with Abu Bakr and Umar عنهما, as guests, he exclaimed, there is no one who is greater in honor and nobility than me today because of these guests of mine. No one who has more noble guests than I have this day. So he then went and fetched branches from the date tree. And he brought these branches and laid them before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and brought water. So there were all kinds of dates on these palm branches. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and Umar radiyallahu anhumah began eating dates and drinking water. The same thing. Then he went and he picked up a knife. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized that he's going to slaughter a goat or a sheep, an animal. So he said to him, do not slaughter an animal that gives milk. So the Ansari companion went, slaughtered a goat and then cooked it, prepared it and brought the food to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and Umar radiyallahu anhum are the guests and they all ate together. When they finished, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, surely we will be questioned about this blessing on the day of reckoning. So Umar radiyallahu anhum said, Ya Rasulullah, will we be questioned about this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes. You were hungry. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved your hunger and gave you food. And Allah quenched your thirst and gave you water. So thumma latus'alunna yawma'idhin anin na'im. Whether it's food or drink or milk, or whether it's dates, a staple such as dates or, and water for the Arabs. Air and water. Every single blessing, we will be questioned about it on the day of reckoning. Gratitude is good. It's not just about an obligation that we should be grateful to Allah. We have to be. Of course, it's an obligation. But this is a good attitude to have. It's a good approach. It's a good lifestyle. It's a good disposition to possess. To be grateful to focus on the good things, on the positive things, to focus on what we have. Today, in modern day psychology, psychotherapy, in counseling, in mental health treatment, one of the exercises taught to by practitioners of mental health to their patients is learning how to be grateful and expressing that gratitude. So people are actually given exercises, go away, keep a journal, keep a diary, every single day of all the good things in your day, in your life, that you should be happy for, that you should be grateful for, and that you can count amongst your blessings. This is actually a form of therapy, a treatment. Because gratitude creates positivity. By helping people focus on the positives and avoiding the negatives. And what are the negatives mentioned in the context of gratitude? And here I'm not talking from a religious perspective. I'm talking from a worldly perspective in modern day mental health treatment, psychology, psychiatry, counselling, these are the strategies that are used, the methods of treatment that are employed, and they're actually quite effective. So what are the negatives that are normally mentioned in the context of gratitude? What, what negative things does gratitude, shukr, help a person avoid? Do you know what's normally mentioned? Envy. Envy. Why envy? It's because when you focus on what you have, 
and you train yourself and your mind, that's what they'd say actually, to train your mind to focus on the positives, on what you have. That what does this do? It makes you feel happy, it makes you feel better, it makes you feel positive, it lifts your spirits, it gives you purpose, it puts things into perspective. It frames your mind towards positive thoughts. And these positive thoughts actually create and engender positive feelings and emotions, which lift people out of depression. Gratitude lifts people out of depression because of all the positivity. That's what shukr does. It's good for a person's mental health and emotional health. And if a person's mental and emotional well-being are in order, this actually has a positive impact on a person's physical health. In fact, one thing about physical health, and this is very true, one of the things that causes the accumulation of fat, especially around the sensitive organs of the body, is not just indulgence and overconsumption of food. It's actually the excessive production of cortisol in the body, the stress hormone. The more stressed you are, the more cortisol is produced in the body at the wrong times. Your body needs some cortisol. But as soon as it becomes excessive, and it's not regulated, it's not balanced, and it's produced at the wrong time by the body, that actually creates the accumulation of fat around sensitive organs, which has got nothing to do with consumption or indulgence. So mental and emotional well-being has an impact on a person's physical health. And the opposite of gratitude, and I'm talking about from a non-religious perspective, is envy. That when a person doesn't focus on what they have, they focus on what they don't have, and what others have. And what does that do? It creates negativity. It creates stress. It creates anxiety. It creates loneliness. L loneliness and lowliness. And it sinks a person into depression. Because a person constantly thinks. Rumination leads to depression. This ruminating, constantly thinking. I want this, I don't have it. He has it, she has it. I want it. And sometimes it's beyond a person's reach. It really is. And what does that do? To aspire to the unattainable. To aspire to the unattainable. To covet the unreachable. That's just torturing oneself. That mental and emotional torture of hasad, of envy, of wanting what others have. And ignoring and overlooking what we have. All that does is create negativity. That negativity frames the mind to negative thoughts. These constant negative thoughts give rise to continuous and constant negative emotions which sink a person into loneliness, lowliness and depression. And it, they then reach a state and a pit and an abyss whereby they are surrounded by many blessings. They possess many gifts and blessings, and yet all they can see is emptiness and darkness. And they genuinely feel that they've got nothing to be grateful for. This can lead to suicidal thoughts. So gratitude is not just a religious obligation. It's a healthy mental and emotional and physical Practice, instrument, and a tool.
and a method of treatment. And this is exactly what Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us. Do not look at others. Do not look at what others have. Look at what you have. Imam Tirmidhi and Imam Ibn Majah rahmatullahi alayhi both relate very beautiful hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, انظروا إلى من هو أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم فإنه أجدر ألا تزدروا نعمة الله عليكم Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Look at those who are beneath you And do not look at those who are above you i.e. in the worldly Look at those who are beneath you. Do not look at those who are above you. For this is far more conducive to you not holding the favour and the blessing of Allah in contempt. This will help you value and appreciate the gifts and the blessings of Allah. And not be contemptuous of the blessings of Allah. Because that's what it is. If a person is not grateful, they are rejecting and contemptuous of what they have. That Allah has given me this. Oh, it's nothing. It's worthless. I don't want this. I want that. I don't want this. I want that. So, such beautiful words. Everything I mentioned about uh, gratitude being a healthy mental and emotional and physical exercise by focusing on what a person has, focusing on the positives in one's life by counting one's blessings. All of that which is taught and practiced today as something new Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that centuries ago. And this is the beautiful hadith. Unzuru ila man huwa asfala minkum, wala tanzuru ila man huwa fawqakum, fa innahu ajdaru alla tazdaru ni'matallahi alaykum. Do not look at those who are beneath you, do not look at those who are above you, for this is far more conducive to you not holding Allah's favours and blessings upon you in contempt. How do we look at those who are beneath us? SubhanAllah. We live here in the UK. Just the average person in the UK, in terms of wealth and possessions, in terms of facilities and amenities, in terms of access to health care, housing, food, drink, and availability of so many things. The average person in this country is part of the global elite. We are far better off than possibly 95% of the world's population. The average person in this country. And if not 95, definitely 90%. We are in the top category of the world's population. We have more than 90% or possibly even 95% of the world's population. Let's look at them. There are those who are severely ill. There are those who are no longer with us. There are those who are disabled. There are those who are suffering mental health issues, physical health issues. There are people who are imprisoned unlawfully. There are people who have been kidnapped. There, have, there are people who have no freedom, shackled, jailed, imprisoned. And even if they are not in a physical prison, 
because of the place they live in. They have no security, no real true freedom. They live in terror. They live in fear. Some people don't even have access to clean drinking water. We truly are part of the global elite. And every day of our lives is actually a blessing. It truly is. We should count our seconds and our minutes, every breath, and regard that as a blessing from Allah. Time, time is a gift from Allah. Life is a gift from Allah. This is why in that hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith related by Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and others, نِعْمَتَانْ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ الصِّحَةُ وَالْفَرَاغُ Related by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma that there are two blessings in which Many people are at a loss. Health and opportunity, health and leisure, free time. Our time is a gift from Allah. We should value it, appreciate it, be grateful for it. And part of that gratitude is not just to say Alhamdulillah, but rather to use that gift and blessing in a manner which pleases the one who gave us that gift. Allah gave us this gift of health. We should use it as Allah wanted us to use it. Allah gave us this gift of life. We should use that life in a manner which pleases Allah, the giver of that life. That is part of gratitude. It's not gratitude to say, Alhamdulillah, thank you, and then abuse the gift. We should be grateful in thought, by tongue, in deed. And the Quran and the Hadith are full of verses and the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, speaking about the virtue, and not just the virtue, but the obligation and the necessity of shukr, of being grateful. In fact, when a person is given a gift by Allah and a person is grateful for that gift, they actually receive as much reward as someone who doesn't have that gift in his patient. So shukr and sabr are both two sides of the same coin. They are a person's reaction to Allah's giving or taking, Allah's rewarding or depriving. And that's all to do with the person's relationship with Allah. Allah gives, the believer is grateful. Allah doesn't give, the believer is patient. That's why in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٌ How wonderful and how marvellous is the affair of a believer. How wonderful and how marvellous is the affair of a believer. In amrahu kullahu khayr. His entire affair, his affair, all of it, his entire affair is good. How? In asabatu sarra'u shakar fakana khayran lah. Wa in asabatu darra'u sabar fakana khayran lah. If good fortune meets him, then he is grateful, so this is good for him. And if a calamity befalls him, then he is patient, and this is good for him. Because shukr and sabr, gratitude and patience, are two sides of the same coin. What is that coin? That is one's relationship with Allah. And when a person develops that relationship with Allah, and develops that mentality and that attitude, they are truly content. 
They actually have more blessings than anyone else. And what is that attitude? That attitude of contentment is that to be content with what a person has, to be grateful for it, and to be patient over what one doesn't have. That leads to peace of mind and tranquility of the soul and contentment of the heart. And that's why in a hadith related by Imam Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الصابر, The one who eats and then is grateful is of the same rank as one who fasts and is patient. So someone who fasts and goes without food and is patient over their hunger and thirst, imagine the reward that they get. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, someone who eats and is grateful to Allah is of the same rank. The wording isn't that they receive the same reward, rather they are similar to each other. They are of the same rank. As I said, shukr and sabr. Gratitude and patience are two sides of the same coin. They, they are both about a person's relationship with Allah. Allah gives, the believer is content. Allah doesn't give, the believer is patient and content. Allah gives, the believer is grateful and content. And both these conditions are good for the believer. How wonderful and how marvelous is the state and the condition and the affair of the believer. His entire affair is good. Truly is. As I said, the, ver- the Quran is replete with verses about the virtue and the necessity and the obligation of being grateful. And the truth is, we are ungrateful. We really are. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِي الشَّكُورٌ And very few of my servants are grateful, as they should be. And, you know, we we shouldn't think that, oh, this is all very philosophical. Be grateful, don't be grateful, uh, uh, avoid ingratitude. No. Ingratitude is so dangerous, so harmful, so detrimental that Allah quotes Iblis in the Qur'an in that conversation he had with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed him and condemned him. So Iblis, Shaytan, said to Allah, and this is in the Qur'an, أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He said to Allah, O oh Allah, delay me. Give me some respite. Till the day that they shall be resurrected. Let me do what I want. Till the day they are resurrected. So Allah said to him, you have your time. You have your delayed term. So Iblis, Shaytan, said to Allah, قَالْ فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ He said, Oh Allah, just as you have led me astray, So I will surely sit on your straight path before them. Then I before creation. Then I shall come to them from in front of them, from behind them, from the the right side, from their left side. So this is what Shaytan said to Allah, O Allah, I will sit in the middle of your road, your straight path, Yusirat Mustaqim, I will sit right in the middle of it to prevent them. I will leave no stone unturned. I will leave no opportunity. I will attack them. I will attack your creation. I will attack them and come to them from in front, from behind, from the left, from the right. All of these are words mentioned in this verse. Then, once I do all of this, what will you see, O Allah? 
Iblis doesn't mention any sins that, oh, they will do this, they will do that. Iblis says, وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ And you will, fi- you will not find most of them grateful. You will not find most of them grateful. Even Shaytan, even Iblis knows how harmful, how dangerous, and how detrimental ingratitude is. Iblis said to Allah, I will attack them. I will sit in your straight path. I will attack them from all sides. And what will they do once I've attacked them? They won't be grateful. They will be ungrateful. So, shukr leads to positivity, mental health and well-being, emotional health and well-being, physical health and well-being. It leads to joy, it leads to happiness, it leads to appreciating life. And this is, from a purely worldly perspective, and from a religious perspective, gratitude, shukr, leads to a person being forever grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being content. It leads to good deeds, it leads to a positive outlook in religion, it leads to spirituality. And ingratitude, from a worldly perspective, leads to negativity in thought, in emotion. It leads to depression. It really does, because ingratitude, as I've said before, is when a person feels that they've got nothing to be grateful for. They don't focus on what they have, they focus on what others have. When we focus on what others have, that's depressing. We want what they want have. And we're never happy. It's never enough. We want what they have. And sometimes it's unattainable. And constantly focusing on others leads to negativity. Because it does lead to me. If you can't get it, then you're always yearning for it, longing for it, aspiring to it. And it's unattainable, it's unachievable. It's beyond one's reach. What does that do to one's positivity, one's mental health, one's emotional well-being? It totally destroys it. It reduces a person's self-esteem. Because they're always comparing themselves to others. In worldly terms. And that actually leads to depression. It does. It leads to depression. Depression sadly leads to suicidal thoughts. So it's remarkable, it goes full circle. A person acts as though they have no blessings, even though they have, a, they have many. And that negativity may ultimately lead them to deprive themselves of the greatest blessing and gift that they have, which is their life. Do not look at those who are Beneath you, above you, rather look at those who are beneath you, as the Prophet said. So, gratitude leads to, from a worldly perspective, uh, sorry, ingratitude from a worldly perspective leads to negativity, it leads to depression. It really does. Count your blessings daily. Develop this mental skill of focusing on what you have and be happy with what you have. rather than looking at what others have. You can find your joy and your happiness and your positivity in yourself, rather than trying to derive that positivity, joy and happiness from others. There's so much that can be said about gratitude. As I said, the Qur'an is full of verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the prophets of Allah to be grateful. They regarded every blessing as a test. Sulaiman alayhi salam, when he witnessed the power that Allah had given him and the command and control over many forces that Allah had assigned to him, he exclaimed, this is from the bounty of my Lord. 
هذا من فضل ربي ليبلوني أشكر أم أكفر ومن شكر فإنما يشكر لنفسه This is from the bounty and the grace of my Lord so that he may test me that am I grateful or am I ungrateful أشكر أم أكفر same شكر وكفر ومن شكر فإنما يشكر لنفسه He continues this is the Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, and whoever is grateful, then he is grateful for the betterment and the benefits of his own soul. And whoever is ungrateful, then indeed Allah is independent, unneeding, noble. In another verse, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ يَشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرْ لِنَفْسِهِ And indeed, verily, we bestowed wisdom upon Luqman. Allah gave Luqman great wisdom. And what's the first thing Allah mentions of that wisdom? The very first thing that Allah mentions of the great wisdom that he bestowed upon Luqman. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ Be grateful for to Allah. And whoever is grateful, then indeed he is grateful for the benefit of his own soul. And whoever is ungrateful, then verily Allah is independent, full of praise. So, Allah instructed the Prophet ﷺ to be grateful. And Allah contrasted Shukr with kufr repeatedly in the Quran. And the Prophet وسلم, he himself has taught us how to be grateful. I'll end with just one hadith. Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and others all relate from the Prophet. وسلم, well, from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that the Prophet وسلم, he would Pray at night. He would rise for the hajjah and for the nightly vigil and the nightly prayer. He would rise at night and pray for long hours. And he would stand for so long until his feet would become swollen. Allahu Akbar. so the sahaba radiyallahu anhum others including umm al-mu'mineen aisha radiyallahu anha all said to him that o messenger of allah why do you have to stand for so long in prayer in this manner so much so that your feet become swollen when qad ghafara allah laka ma taqaddama min dhanbika wa ma ta'akhkhar when allah has forgiven all that has passed before or will come for you allah has forgiven everything so why do you still stand in prayer in this manner so much so that your feet become swollen? And the Prophet ﷺ's reply was, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدٍ شَكُورًا So what? Should I not be a grateful servant to Allah? We should be grateful to Allah not only for our body, our health, our water, our food, our drink, our air, our life, our daily blessings, but the greatest gift, Guidance, Hidayah. As Allah says, Kama arsalna fikum rasulam minkum, yet ru alikum ayatina, we is a kikum, we are alimukum al kitab wal hikma, we are alimukum manam takunu ta'ala moon, fathkuruni, athkurukum mashkuruni, wala takfurun. Just as I have sent to you a messenger from yourselves who recites to you my verses. And who nurtures you and teaches you the book and wisdom and teaches you that which you did not know. So Allah then says, these are my gifts and my blessings to you. I sent you a messenger who conveyed my verses to you, who nurtured you, who taught you the book, who taught you wisdom. Who taught you things you did not know. This is my gift and blessing to you. So what should you do? 
فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, I shall remember you. وَشْكُرُونِي And be grateful to me. وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ And to not be ungrateful to me. So we have, a, apart from our worldly things of health, wealth, life, air, water, food, nourishment, sustenance, apart from these worldly things, our greatest blessing and gift is hidayah and guidance from Allah. And for that we should be grateful to. Remember me, I shall remember you. And be grateful to me. And do not be ungrateful to me. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand. May Allah make us amongst those who count their blessings daily, all the time. Religious and non-religious. Worldly and unworldly. And... May Allah make us amongst those who are grateful for these blessings and who remain focused and positive. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.